to the second part of the, of the process, which is really trying to make sure that when we analyze the data that comes out of the simulation, we do it in a way that means that we should generate, if you like, trustworthy conclusions from it. And really in this section, I just wanna talk about one aspect of that process, and that is this issue about equilibration. So what do we mean when we talk about um, equilibration? Um, well, typically what we're talking about is that we're running a molecular dynamics simulation. I think this one's supposed to jiggle around a bit. Why not jiggle around? There we are. We've run a molecular dynamics simulation and typically when we start, we've built our system and we've tried to do it very, very carefully. And we've um, done lots of things I haven't talked about, like put it in a box of water and added counter ions and all that sort of thing. But then there's, we understand that there's a process when you start a molecular dynamics simulation of what we might call equilibration or relaxation. Uh, so for example, uh, when we start our simulation, typically we don't have any velocities in our system. So our molecule, our molecular system is effectively at, at zero or some very low temperature. Uh, typically we've maybe we've added some water molecules to it. It's in a periodic box, but that's not fully, the density is not quite right. The, the pressure in the system is not right. So what happens then as we begin our simulation is we can monitor what's actually happening to the pressure, the temperature. Uh, and what we expect to see happening over time is that basically we'll see a graph that looks something like the one I'm showing on the right, where basically the temperature or the pressure, whatever it might be, uh, basically rises and then after a while kind of stabilizes. And then we have this idea that that period at the beginning when the temperature was wrong or the pressure was wrong is basically unphysical and therefore is not a part of our simulation that we should be analyzing when we're trying to understand how it would behave. Uh, and it's only the data beyond that point of the equilibration or relaxation time, which is, if you like, valid data. So that's what we would say is our kind of production phase, and that's where we would collect our data from. Now, if you look at um, molecular dynamics uh, simulation papers, many of them, you'll see graphs like that that uh, to sort of talk about how the person has uh, the group have looked at this question of equilibration and, and very often actually what you're seeing plotted on that axis is not temperature or pressure but it's RMSD. You'll see this terribly commonly uh, that you start off by measuring the root mean square yeah. deviation of the atoms from the starting conformation. And the idea is it rises quickly and then it kind of plateaus and people say there we are we've got things more or less equilibrated and it's okay. So it's my main purpose in this session to try and convince you that this is not a good way of looking at equilibration and relaxation. So, yes, we don't like this. Why is that? Let's think about what molecular dynamics is and what RMSD is measuring. So, in molecular dynamics, you can think of it as being a walk over a potential energy surface. So I'm just illustrating that as so the, the circles of like contours, energy contours, in a, and the, the, the surface of a, the screen is the kind of the, the, the conformational space accessible to the molecule. And the molecule started at that little round circle, and then each little line segment is one step of RMD, and you can see it's moving around, it's changing shape, it's staying within this basin, and that's the molecular dynamics. And when we measure RMSD, what we're doing is we're measuring, in effect, the distance from that circle that map, that's where the beginning of our trajectory is to each of those data points, those, those line segment ends. And so you can see that if you imagine doing that, that if over time you would get a map that would look something like that. And you can see that sometimes the structure is quite close to where it started and sometimes it's a bit further away and it oscillates up and down and that all looks sort of, you know, within with some noise equilibrated. And if you would say that'd be absolutely fine. And then what we do is we have this idea of a model where in fact what actually happened at the beginning is that we weren't quite there, that we started, if you like, from some rather unphysical region of conformational space. And then actually what happened in our simulation is to begin with, the structure of the system rapidly changed shape to get away from this area towards what is a much more low free energy basin in our, in our potential energy or free energy surface. So again, if we imagine what that would look like on an RMSD map, we get this picture that we just saw before. So this, if you like, is the underlying concept behind using RMSD to measure equilibration. 
that our system is behaving as shown on the left hand panel there. But the problem is, is that molecular dynamics of complex biomolecules seldom looks like that. Because what we really have in most biomolecules is we have multiple low energy conformations. We have multiple potential wells. And if you like, our model of molecular dynamics is very often described as jumping amongst minima. This idea that basically what's happening is that the simulation spends some time on these basins, then hops across to another one, then hops across to another, hops back, etc. And this is the characteristic of basically molecular dynamic simulations of any complex system. So again, if you imagine that applying that and thinking about what does that do to our RMS D plot, again, remember each each RMSD value is if in effect a distance from that blue circle in the top left hand corner to one of the points in our trajectory that you could imagine that over time it would begin to look something like this that it's going to have these kind of flat bits and then spikes and then flat bits and then spikes and one could say well that's all okay that sort of tells us what's going on because each of these kind of plateau regions is it being in one or other of these conformational basins uh, we can see that A is closer to the, the blue circle than B and C, uh, and then later on we move to uh, B or C. And you can see that what's rather nice, actually, almost, would be that the RMSD would be showing you the way in which it was moving between these basins. But actually, there's a problem, because that graph that I've shown on the right-hand side, it's only a cartoon, but it's clearly actually not a very accurate cartoon. Because actually, if we look on the left-hand side, we can see that basins B and C are actually equidistant, almost equidistant from that starting point, that blue circle at the beginning of our trajectory. So really the RMSD plot on the right shouldn't look like I've drawn it there. It's gonna look like this. So what you can see actually is that RMSD is entirely incapable of showing you that the system was oscillating or maybe in a non-equilibrated way between two different basins. It's detecting the difference between basins A and B and C, but it can't tell the difference between B and C. And more generally, this is the problem with RMSD as a measure of equilibration. It doesn't really tell you any of the fine detail of the conformational changes that are going on in our system. And it can radically underestimate the time that it's taking for a system to equilibrate. Now, you're going to do some exercises later on when we go back to the hands-on session where you can look at this in a little bit more detail. Um, so I'm going to leave you to do that but I'm just basically the take home message really is that RMSD plots are of limited value. Um, certainly if you have an RMSD plot that looks like the one on the left that you know things are bad. I mean there's absolutely and nobody's going to pretend that that is an equilibrated system. You clearly need to run a longer simulation to get some valid data. But what I'm going to be arguing here and what hopefully you'll see for yourselves when you do the hands-on session is just getting a, a plot which looks like the one on the right, which is the one you'll see in, unfortunately, in paper after paper after paper. That is no guarantee of equilibrium at all. Uh, so this is, can be a bit of a problem, but uh, we're going to talk a little bit about ways in which you can get around this. So. If we can't use RMSD to assess equi equilibration, what are we going to do about it? Well, let's just remind ourselves about why we're doing this. We've got this concept that we can kind of divide our molecular dynamics simulation into two phases, what we call the equilibration phase, where the question is, is this system now relaxed? And that when we can answer yes to that, we move into the production phase, where again, we have new questions that we want to ask ourselves. You know, have we got good sampling here? Is our, have we got all the data to, to get to a converged answer to whatever it is we're interested in? And what I'm going to argue here is that actually trying to separate these two things out into separate questions doesn't work. That actually you need to think about equilibration and sampling and convergence in a holistic manner. So one thing about thinking about relaxation is that it's not a global activity. Different parts of a protein will kind of relax at different rates. Uh, the core region of a protein is generally very well packed. It's not very flexible. Often that will relax really quite quickly. Whereas surface loops and things like that that wave around in the breeze may take much more time before they're well sold. 
Um, main chains, again, of the protein, the protein main chain may relax faster than, than side chains. And highly structured elements in your protein, alpha helices, beta, beta sheets, will generally relax faster than the unstructured ter turn and loop regions. Now, what that means, this sometimes is very useful. Because what that means is that if you're interested in, in one part of a protein, for example, how well a ligand binds to a deeply buried, very rigid binding cavity, then you don't need to, you may not need to worry quite so much about whether a particular loop, which is far away from this binding site, is, is like fully sampled or fully relaxed. So the first message really is that when you're thinking about relaxation and sampling, think about it in relation to the metric that really matters to you. So that's the real, if I, the first take home message, assess equilibration and convergence and sampling based on the metric that you're actually interested in, not on some surrogate, which is what RMSD is. Mostly you're, nobody's ever interested in what the RMSD is. That's not the answer to the, if you like the experimental question. So for that reason, it shouldn't be used as the equilibration metric. Use the thing that you're actually interested in. So here's this uh, approach that we, we use increasingly now, and, and we do see used along the way, uh, to trying to think holistically about equilibration, sampling, and convergence. So let's imagine that we've done a molecular dynamic simulation. Uh, we have a set of trajectory data, and we know that within that trajectory data, there's probably some which is not equilibrated, and part that we hope is, and that's our production phase. But right now, we don't know where those are. So if like we were showing that orange section at the beginning as being the equilibration phase, but we really don't know where that is or how big it is. So what do we do? Well, one thing that we can do is we can imagine to begin with that there is no possible problem about equilibration at all, that the full trajectory is entirely relaxed and everything is absolutely fine. So now in that case, we ask our question, what really matters to us, which is, is this converged? Is this a well-sampled simulation? Well, you could say that if it is, if it's basically well-sampled, well-converged, then what you could do is you could take that equilibrated trajectory and you could divide it into two halves. You could take the first half and you could take the second half. And then what you could do for each of those half trajectories is you could, from that alone, calculate whatever the metric is that you are interested in. Maybe it is the percentage of the time that the structure stays in each of those conformational basins. Maybe it's something completely different. Maybe it's the distance between the N and C termini of the protein. Maybe it's the radius of gyration of the protein. It really doesn't matter what it is, but that's the metric that really matters to you. And what you could do is you could calculate that for the first half of the simulation and independently for the second half. And you could compare the values you, could, you got and ask yourself how similar they are. Now the chances are that if you do that, that you're gonna get two numbers which don't look terribly much the same because the data in the first half of your simulation is biased by the fact that it contains a significant amount of data from what is the equilibration phase of your trajectory. Um, so, but you don't know how big it is, but it, it's probably there. So what can you do? Well, what you can do is this, you can just shave a little bit of data off the beginning of the simulation and then take the rest of it and divide it in two again and calculate the metric. Now, if it's, as I've shown here, you've removed a certain amount of that biased, unequilibrated data. So when you compare the metrics of your choice for the first and second halves of remaining data, you'll see that basically the agreement between them improves. And basically, if you then take a little bit more off the full trajectory, it'll get better again. And then eventually there comes a point when hopefully they get about as good as they can get because you've removed all this, un, this biased, unequilibrated part. Um, you can almost tell if you've gone too far because obviously the degree to which the metrics agree for the first or the second half of the simulation are gonna depend on how much data you've got. If you basically get rid of a lot of the data, then the chances are just by the, the law of statistics that the agreement that you'll get between the first and second halves of whatever data remains will basically appear to degrade. So one can see a process here by which as you begin to shave more and more off the simulate, the full length of the simulation, and then compare whatever metric is of interest for the first and second halves, then one could see a process by which basically the agreement in your metric for the first and second halves of the data 
improves. But then if you go too far, it begins to get worse again. And this is a, a process which we find works really very well. And in fact, you can have a go and play with it yourself when you get to the hands-on session. Now you can actually take this uh, methodology further because another way to really, if you like, check for sampling and conversion is to use replicates. And that's something that's very easy to do. Uh, nowadays, it's not very difficult to get enough computer time to run a simulation. So don't run one simulation, run lots of simulations, run replicates in the same way that if you were a biologist working in a biology lab, you'd run replicates, replicate experiments. Uh, you should run replicate experiments when you're doing a computer simulation because molecular dynamics is inherently a stochastic process and if you run the same simulation twice you do not get the same trajectory because all those little random fluctuations and random numbers that went into velocities etc uh, but this is really useful because what really matters is not what one simulation does it's what happens irrespective of which simulation of the system you look at so again a good test of sampling convergence is to basically run the simulation several times and then convince yourselves that it doesn't matter which of these ones you look at you get the same answer to your question so again one thing you can do is run these simulations compare the metrics and that tells you basically about your convergence now how does that relate to this equilibration problem it's a separate issue you've got to deal with this thing separately you've got to take each of those simulations those arrows the simulation one and the simulation two and you've got to apply that methodology that we talked on the previous slide independently to each of those but when you've done that you can then if you like use this method this multiple replicate simulation method to improve your ability to convince yourself that your what you've done is well converged and well sampled so let me just give you an example of that uh, which is actually going back to that very first slide that was flickering on your screen at the beginning of this session. Remember, we were talking about the molecular dynamics of alanine pentapeptide, this conformational clustering uh, that showed that basically about 10% of the time it appears to exist in an alpha helical state. Now, actually, when this experiment was done, it wasn't just one molecular dynamics simulation of alanine pentapeptide. In fact, what was done is we ran 100 independent simulations and each of those 100 independent simulations was 100 nanoseconds long. So that's what 10 microseconds of data. It's a small system, but that's a significant piece of work. But it was really interesting to do that and to look at what you get. So they say what you can do is you can take the dynamics from each of those 100 replicate simulations and you can do this kind of conformational analysis. And in fact, the results of that are shown in this little part of it are just shown you in this little table here. So what we've got column, the columns basically C1 to C9 are the, those nine different conformational yeah. states. And each row is the percentage of time that one of the replicate simulations, R0 to R99, spent in each of those states. And what you can see is that actually from replicate to replicate, even though the simulations were 100 nanoseconds long, you often get very different results. So, for example, replicate two really got rather stuck in conformational state one. It, it occupied it for 52 percent of the time, whereas most of the others only sample that state for around 30 percent of 20 to 30 percent of the time. And there are other cases where individually simulations either seem to oversample or undersample significantly different conformational states even though they were so long now though what you can do though is instead of treating each of those replicates individually take say them in groups of 10 or 20 or something like that and chunk the data together and then analyze that in fact if you take it in groups of 20 and do the same statistical analysis of how well populated the different conformations are you can see in front of your eyes this convergence occur because now if we take data from 20 simulations at a time we can see that no matter we're looking at simulations 0 to 19 or 20 to 39 or whatever they might be our predictions about the amount of time that alanine pentapeptide spends in any of these conformational states is all is highly converged and in particular our prediction of the time that it spends in the alpha helical state which actually is c4 here can see is pretty reliably between 10 and 11 percent which is why we were able to make that statement on the previous slide that alanine pentapeptide 
certainly in this particular situation, appears to spend 10% of its time in an alpha helical conformation. So uh, in terms of sort of wrapping up, if you like, that second sort of hands-on session, I, I hope that basically I've convinced you of uh, certainly of the first thing that, that RMSD, despite the fact that it appears so often in papers, is usually not a good metric for assessing equilibration. Uh, and that a far better approach really is to think about equilibration and sampling issues as, as I say here, two sides of the same coin. You can't really separate out these two processes. You can't imagine there's equilibration and then there's sampling. It's, it's never quite as straightforward as that. And then the, the final point also terribly important is uh, assess equilibration and sampling on the basis of what really interests you. Why are you doing this simulation in the first place? And, and that's another um, issue that comes up sometimes. It's quite easy nowadays, especially if you're not paying massive amounts of attention, to click a few boxes and start a molecular dynamic simulation on something that interests you. But the question always should be is why, why are you doing this? And um, it, you know, sometimes people say, well, I just wanted to see what was gonna happen. And that's generally not a good reason to run any molecular dynamic simulation. Start by knowing what question is the question is that you're trying to answer. Uh, and that will then tell you what the metrics are that are of interest to you and that you're then gonna use to assess whether or not this simulation is telling you anything useful or not. But just seeing what happens is really genuinely, and we, we've done it I must say, in the past ourselves many times, it's not generally a useful thing to do. Have an idea why you're doing this simulation before you start it. Um, okay, that's really all I wanted to, to talk about now, but although we've got a little bit of time left, uh